One spot for every four units. Kristen, can you answer that? Yes. Kirsten. 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 Uh, Kirsten. Uh, so, uh, yes, I can answer that. There's really different levels of how much of a parking reduction we can get through this program. So let me just kind of remind you all, right now in your neighborhood, you're required to provide one unit, one parking space per one unit of housing. So, oh, thank you. Uh, so, so that came along in the 1950s because before that we had no parking requirements, and then everyone brought cars into the city, and it was like, oh, we need to have these requirements. We made some number up. It was one to one. Seems kind of good. Other cities have different numbers. Uh, when we updated our zoning um, in other plan areas, we noticed that while the requirement for any building from 1950 on was that for each unit of housing you have one parking space, that's not actually what our building stock is. Most of our buildings were built before the 1950s. A lot of people put parking in them, but not everybody. So we're actually parked in as a city, and I'm going to sort of round this number, maybe 0.5 or 0.6% per housing unit. We don't have one-to-one -one parking in the city. Um, and so I think this is really a, a time in our city's growth where we're just kind of saying, okay, we swung the pendulum this way, and now we're swinging it back. Why is it really important to make this program work? We have a lot of questions. Okay. If we, if we could just stay up. The answer's up here. This is for the local program and for the, I don't have this, oh, for the state program, it's 0.5, so 50%, you can ask for a 50% reduction. And for the local program, 0.5 means for every one, for every two units, you would have one parking space. And then a 75% reduction means for every four units, you would have one parking space. <laughs> Uh, Bruce Osterwill. Yeah. <coughs> Did that answer your question on parking, or do you have a follow-up? No, I, I, I just think that's too much parking. We already have too, much, too oh. many parks. Oh. <laughs> I, I, I'm like many of the people. I'm a member of the dinosaur generation that still has cars, and we're too dependent on the whole planet's too dependent on cars, and especially, especially. California and San Francisco has too high an automobile density. That's why we have congestion. Thank you. You know, we um, we asked the folks from planning and the mayor's office and everybody to bring their notepads out to take back how you feel. So those comments are important if they make it into the record. Uh, Amber Yada, are you still here? Higher 
grand of diversity in the types of households that are feeling stable and paying a lower percentage of their income for housing costs. Did you want to chime in? Um, I, I know these things well. This is, you know, like staff, this is sort of our area of expertise. We're kind of affordable housing wonks. Uh, but I will respectfully say and disagree. This is not an up to. The reality is that these things are priced at very specific levels. And, and either you're, you're, you're not eligible because you're over, over income or your income's too far below that you're not able to leverage yourself high enough. So it's been, a, again, a, a, a discussion and debate we have with the city about making sure we're kind of providing different levels along that chart that I'm telling you. Uh, is, is there, particularly in the rental world, uh, there's really nothing that's happening above the 55% of the inclusionary. There may be some that they do this so-called dial program, but I think the jump between 55% of the median income, which is what inclusionary is now, and 120 is huge, 55 to 120. There's nothing in between 70, 90, 100, whatever it might be. Same thing with ownership. Our ownership units, the only real effective way now we've been able to provide below market ownership units is through the inclusionary housing again. And they're, they're typically 90% of the Airbnb income. So when you jump all the way up to 140, you know, again, you're missing points in there. So I, I, I think we all understand the tools. This becomes a question of priorities, and the city has laid out some priorities. They're, they're coming from the mayor's office about wanting to prioritize middle income. We think that it should actually be spread along with more of a range. All right. So I'm just going to jump around. Are there any incentives planned for in-law units? Um, so this program is primarily about new construction. Um, in-laws are primarily a tool for looking at your existing housing and you know adding a unit in the garage or the backyard. And so it's kind of unrelated to this. I've never seen a new construction project with an in-law unit already built in. I think that's a new idea, so we'll write that down. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'm going to read this question. I can't say as I understand it. Um, it's complicated. Let's see if any of the housing folks in the room can get it. How do the requirements of the revised 1979 State of Affordable, affordable Housing Law relate to the requirements of SB 375, Bay Area Sustainable Communities Integrated Transportation Land Use and Housing Plan? Does the 79 law preempt SB 375? I should have just called on you, Lauren, right? Uh, this feels like graduate school homework. <laughs> <laughs> But I, I think SB 375 basically it tries to encourage localities to build sustainably. And by sustainably, they mean moving people near transit, near goods and services, so we can reduce um, our greenhouse gases and our vehicle miles traveled. So I think there's been some contention, um, or there, someone asserted that you know this is not a good area for building housing, there's not good transit and services and jobs, and that's really sort of an interesting perspective. When you live in a city that's 49 square miles, you can really feel the differences. But when you zoom out and you look at the region, all of a sudden, the Richmond looks really well served and like a really great place for access for jobs and transit and services and all of those things. So I think it really has to do with the, the perspective that you're taking. And so I'm taking your question as a, a regional Regionalism question. Well, it is a regional question, but um, the law requires that if we increase the number of jobs, then we have to provide more housing commensurate with that increase. And uh, our response to that city has been to the primary development areas, mostly in downtown, the east and the east side of the city, is not the market. But it seems that we're going to be developing housing there. I guess it's going to be models up on one point, but Jason is saying that we're building up on one so I'm wondering why are we coming out? Is there that much we need to come out here in the states when we are not getting those commensurate improvements in say transportation? We're talking about the BRT may happen, it won't increase the capacity of the transit system along the long period boulevard. They may go faster, but won't increase the capacity. I'm worried that we're going to get these increases, increase intensity is just bonus, and yet not that we get the commensurate improvements. 
here, but we're going to get through all of them, but three I can do at once. First of all, at the uh, Planning Association for the Richmond's website, there's a link to a um, Richmond District survey. Uh, I, I, as I stand here, I can't remember the name of it. Richmond Strategy. Richmond Strategy. If you go there, you can weigh in and take that survey. They did a similar one in the sunset. Uh, next, Ian McLean. Ian and McLean is uh, concerned. Uh, I would want you all to post the minutes, agendas, correspondence, and attendees, etc., of the Mayor's Housing Workshop on your website. The work group. Work group. And uh, similar to that, he would like, uh, and I'd like too, is the, uh, the planning department to use your good offices to encourage the uh, next door website to include the full city so the Richmond can post to Knob Hill and the Mission and uh, other places on this topic. I can uh, answer that question if you want. I work for next door. Oh, good. Here. Thank you. Yes. Um, my name's Bobak, and it won't happen. Um, <laughs> I'm sorry, but uh, it, it, it will happen. We, we want it to happen. I, so I can you make it happen? I understand if it want to happen, but the way that next door is defined neighborhoods is that there's a, a, a core value proposition when people, and I assume several of you were on next door, that when you join, you're joining your private neighborhood social network, not your city social network or your state social network. So I get it that people want a way to communicate on a citywide level. The only way to do that currently under our platform is, and I'm speaking as a well, I'm speaking as myself, because I also like, I need to support tickets, so I know what I'm talking about. Um, Good. Well, I, Could I suggest this rather than you know, sure, sometimes sure. telling seventy people what you can't do is is not helpful. But he maybe, can do it. He can. Second, maybe if you could. I do have. I do have a suggestion. Could, well, can I suggest this? No, sure. Sure. It's already maybe if done. you go back and say there is a particular issue. I don't know if you can organize it by issue, but uh, you know it's great out here for us. A lot of us use next door, but. To this point, this is a citywide issue. Can I just make one? So, just so there is a word around something. this, which is that there are certain uh, planning department, uh, we have something called the agency program, which right. allows city agencies to 
spit on next door, like the uh, Captain Silverman, who's crime updates and, and funny anecdotes on free from time to time. Agencies have the ability to offer something citywide. Um, so if the planning department wanted to utilize their posting authority to offer something citywide, there you go. then allow that conversation to occur. There you go. They can do that. But Allow them any one resident to create a post that hits the entire city. No, that, that's a good, that's a good solution. Of what we we so, sort of, like for this meeting tonight, the planning uh, department could have gotten it out citywide if, if we went that way using their office. Okay, so. The Department the of Co Emergency Management Sorry, is already doing it. The Department of Urge Emergency Management is already doing this Thanks. citywide. I want to keep the questions okay. going right, right. now. I appreciate the comment. Uh, Kirsten, there's a Kirsten. There is a uh, a question about down payment assistance. Uh, is there any down payment assistance uh, under the affordable housing bonus program? I'll defer to Jeff on that. That's helpful. Well, okay. No. <laughs> okay. Or any housing Easiest purchase? We'll okay. Uh, no. 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 What what happened to the there's records? No. What happened to the records of the working group? Are we going to get those on the website? He asked that. I know, but they didn't manage. I didn't manage that. So you, you can do that. I no, I did not manage that process. So, so here's a question, uh, Rob Poole, Are you here? <laughs> Rob, do you want to ask the question? Or do you want me to read it? Yes. Curious. How much new housing are we building right now? All the new housing that's affordable to residents earning 120 percent AMI to 140 percent. We have a traditional PMI or a market rate. How how much? What, what, what needs being met? Can I help? I, I think your question is, is the for-profit market serving people who are at 125, 140, 150% of their union income? And the answer, you know, shortly, and I don't know, maybe Peter has some other example, but the answer, I think, is no. Um, we know that even for renters, um, flipping back like a mad person. The the market rate rent for new and used housing, when you average it out, is at you know three thousand for a studio, one bedroom, and five thousand for a three bedroom. So I believe new construction prices are at the high end of that spectrum, and then the sales prices also. So I don't believe the market is serving that. That's what the point is that we're not serving for a group of people, and they're stuck in the middle. Right, and I would answer that you're correct, but it's not just 120 or 140. The city, not the city, but the market is not building for folks anywhere really above 60% AMI to whatever number you want to put on it. And that's the point of this diagram that we have is we have a lot of people that are part of our Yeah, you want to move to the block. Oh, oh, okay. Okay, we have a lot of people in San Francisco that are stuck in the middle. The, the, the middle, like it is in, in America, in terms of, of income disparity, because folks, that's the bottom line. And you see the Brookings Institute report from about a year and a half ago. San Francisco now has the greatest income disparity of any city in the country. Like, we overtook New York. Isn't that something to be proud of? And this is an issue globally, right? So income disparity is creating a widened middle class that's left out. So the reality, is that we have a wide range of folks for whom the market ain't building. It's not just 120, 140. So as they say, you can pick your winners and losers, but that's not how we think we should approach city policy. And ultimately, there's going to be some folks who gain more than others, but it's a healthy debate to talk about where is that critical need, who's most being shut out of the market, who's got the most critical conditions, and not just decide because 120, 140 is where there's now a new kind of stretched middle class, everybody below that is sort of left behind. I also want, since I've got the mic, <laughs> I want to say just one quick thing about the transportation question you had. Um, and, and, and again, this is a hard part about being a city. Everything doesn't work in perfect synchronization. The fact is, transportation investments, and infrastructure, and services, or whatever it is, are generally not aligned with the timing of growth or the, even the geography of growth. We like to do it in our area plans. Kirsten and I suffered for 10 years through the Market Octavia planning process, and it's Choo Choo have been involved in all of them, Rincon Hill, Eastern Neighborhoods, Market Octavia, you name it. 
And it's very difficult to actually have transportation or any infrastructure growth really meet the timing of your housing growth and, the, the, and the growing population. It's just this, the bureaucracy forces against that. The source of the money forces against that. So the best you can get is to plan really explicitly for it. But frankly, with all due respect, just because developers are paying a fee, the new $7.50 fee, only on, unit, only on housing above 20 units, by the way, so a lot of Richmond stuff is going to be uh, exempt. That may or may not go anywhere that's related to where development's happening. It's not a bad thing, there's transportation needs everywhere. But just to be very kind of clear about it, there's no linkage between transportation investments and housing development. They might happen in parallel paths, but that's the best it gets. So, that's good. You answered the question that, about. Um, he answered a question that I can skip the card on. But Jason yeah, wants to right. weigh in on the affordability issue. Right. You asked a very specific question. Here's a very specific answer from the uh, San Francisco Planning Department Housing Inventory Report. In 2014, 21% was affordable housing. 21% of new units that went on the market were affordable housing. There's your answer. Affordable, which is defined by, which is affordable, defined by them as inclusionary units, units built in secondary units, and affordable units, which they've defined in here apparently as below market rate. If I can clarify. We don't have a way to track affordable that's not subsidized, so those subsidized units are at 90%, 60%, 55 okay. and his question was the other. But Here's a couple uh, for all of you. Um, the person talks about the changes in their neighborhoods in different parts of the city, and they said, what happens to the, light, the quality of life of current residents? And maybe you all want to weigh in on that. That, that's a great question. Um, I think I've been asked this at every community meeting for every project I've ever done. Um, and it's a good question. It's a fair question. I think um, it really depends on what values and pieces of your community are really important to you. Um, for me personally, I live in Alamo Square. What I really like about my neighborhood is there are people on the street, there are neighborhood services. And the, there's sort of activity on the street, and I feel safe at night walking around because there are people out there with me. So when you see more density in your neighborhood, you're going to see more services, you're going to see more people on the street, more activity. If that's a positive for you, that's a benefit. In addition to that, I think you're going to see stability in your neighborhood when you have the affordable housing for people of different income levels that feel safe and secure that can come and participate in your neighborhood as well as the new market rate housing. Um, and I know there are other people that want to chime in on this topic. Hi. Wait a second. I'll let you moderate. No, we're, take, we're using the cards tonight, and I'll try and... Okay. Um, two people ask questions about demolition, and that's come up in a number of ways. One, the quality of life issues around demolition. They're also looking at the demolition um, work around the BRT or, I guess, the construction. But my question is, there's a fear of robo-demolitions coming uh, by this program. So could you uh, weigh in on that? Sure. Um, so I think... Robo demolition has a lot of different meanings, or some people have referenced sort of the redevelopment era strategy of kind of removing some of our most valuable housing and dumping it into the bay. I saw some terrible images of that. We've done a few things that we think are really going to help. Um, first of all, the city of San Francisco really does not look fondly upon the demolition of housing. With without this program, rent control, not rent control, we have all kinds of public process around that. I think part of that is because it's good policy, and part of it is because we're all, as a planning community, scarred from this, the redevelopment era and the mistakes that were made there. So let's say you want to demolish a unit today, just you know, without any other incentive or program, you still have to have a public hearing, 
We do see our commission think seriously about that and often reject those proposals. But we've kind of taken that further. We've said a robo-demolition. No, we're going to put a cap on the number of lots that you can put together so that you don't see someone saying, oh, look, this whole block of Geary is like, great, I'll just knock it all down and build one big mega structure. Right? I think we learned a lot from the 60s. Maybe mega structures aren't successful uh, and, and don't work for a neighborhood. And so that's part of that as well. And then finally, are people interested in the walkthrough again on the rent control protections? Or are we good with understanding well, that we have some financial barriers for have a question. that? And we're going to get there next. So, uh, here's a, a good question. What if a current affordable family uh, has an increase in income and is no longer uh, uh, eligible? Does that tenant get evicted? So, who does the oversight and the monitoring on this? So, I guess the question speaks to an affordable unit that's used for rental purposes. So, um, in our current program, you are allowed to go over the income level. Um, so let's say you have a job status change and you were, you were able to earn more income, um, about 20% more than what um, you would be allowed under the program without being asked to leave. If you exceed that amount, um, I, think we, I think the program is designed for a certain income level and for a certain purpose. And we really want to make sure that that person, um, that that unit is reserved for somebody in need at that income level. So there is a transition period if you, let's say, make 50 or 60 uh, extra thousand dollars um, and you have a, a major job, job status change, then, then we would likely have to transition you out of the unit. But if you just gradually make slightly more money, you'd still be allowed to stay. There, the question was, how, who follows up on that? Uh, the Mayor's Office of Housing does the monitoring for those units. Um, there's also these notice of special restrictions that are put on the units themselves, an affordability covenant that is uh, basically a requirement of the unit that would require that those units are rented for a certain income level, and they're monitored by the Mayor's Office of Housing and Community Development. Thank you. There's a number of questions, and yours is a very good question I was actually going to get to the issue of process and review of these projects. Here's a question. What recourse does an owner have if they are faced with uh, a building two or three stories taller than next door? Uh, and there are other questions that relate to who's looking over sunlight. I, I think there's a, uh, a general uh, feeling like the process isn't very robust now for the single homeowner uh, you know, wanting to go and, and weigh in on a project. And with all these changes to planning in the city, I guess you're curious, are there changes to how they're going to be able to weigh in? Uh, so first, I would say San Francisco by far and away has the most robust community planning process and engagement opportunity for development and housing um, in comparable cities like Seattle or Boston. Much larger projects go through with no public notification or public input. I'm not saying that one way or the other is correct, but I'm trying to put some context on those expectations that we do have. This is you know, a, a high-level map of our current review process. So there's the preliminary project assessment. So the developer has an idea. They write a letter to the planning department. Here's my idea. My building is drawn in pretty boxy form. What do you think? We look at it. We give them suggestions on design and sort of use content, things like that. Is it consistent? What are their requirements? What fees might you have? Then they have a pre-application meeting with the community. They're required to notify people within two, three hundred, I don't know how many feet of their home or their property. Uh, then all of those comments are sent to the planning department as well as the initial application. That goes through environmental review to make sure that we have the water, sewer, infrastructure, transportation, all of the things that we need for that building. And then it comes upstairs to our planners, our current planners, who review the project. We complete design review. Um, those current planners are the planners that you all call when you go to our website and you find out your neighbor's doing something or you're tracking that project and their name pops up. Send them your comments, send them your questions. They're your ambassador between the developer and the project. They often are trying to get the developer to do the same thing you are, and the more energy they have, the better the process goes. 
Once the planning department has completed its review, then they would notify the neighborhood, hey, we're about to approve this project. And that is when um, you'll get a note in the mail. I think it's a broader pool than the first notification. And then it goes to a public hearing. So then the planning commission hears from staff, hears from the project sponsor, and then hears from anyone in the public, including um, any, anyone who chooses to participate in that hearing, their comments before they review and approve the project. We're not changing that process. It's a long process, I agree. <laughs> we're not changing that process. Um, there was a comment about how we're removing DR. We're not touching DR at all. DR is discretionary review, and that's available when you otherwise wouldn't go to the commission. Since all of these projects will be going to the planning commission, there's no need for the neighborhoods to pay money and file a request for that. All, all of these projects automatically go to the commission. Thank you. Um, what will happen to a displaced, the way I'm reading this is, if a building is going to be torn down, uh, or buildings are going to be torn down to add uh, uh, housing pursuant to the affordable uh, housing bonus program, the question is, uh, has the city made arrangements to help the current, res the displaced residents move, and will they be able to move uh, back in after development? Peter, I think you spoke to this, didn't you? I raised the issue. I think yeah. staff probably has some ideas on how they're planning to solve it. So um, I'll go over this slide one more time. So let's say those purple buildings, the existing unit, the rent control tenant, like myself, are going to be displaced so that this new building can be built. So right now, as drafted, the legislation says, each of those units has to be replaced in the new project. So there have to be an equal number of affordable units in that replacement project. The question of what happens to that tenant, um, San Francisco has the strongest, or some of the strongest tenant protection. So there's some amount of money, I don't know why, but it's five to 18,000, I guess it depends on how many people and your specific, specific case you get for relocation. We don't think that's enough. So the first thing we've added already is to say, the, I just went through that long process, good, good coordination in the issues. Um, as soon as they talk to the planning department the first time, they have to notify all of the current tenants. This may create a lot of stress for the tenant, but it also gives them, that whole process takes one to three years. So it gives them all of this time to start sort of planning, talking to their community agencies, figuring out how to come up with a movement plan. What we'd like to add, and we think is a really good policy, is the right to return. So let's say I'm living in one of those purple houses, I would have a right to return to one of the orange or orange and purple houses at a level that makes it so I'm only paying 30% of my income. So whatever my income might be, I would be guaranteed an affordable place. That's pretty easy. There's still a lot of questions that we're working with the tenant advocates on around what else do I need during that one to two year period when rents right now are at three and five thousand. So we're looking at that, whoever asks this question. So hold on to the mic and uh, would you tell the folks where, if there's a list of soft sites uh, and where they can find it? Um, there is not a list of soft sites. Uh, we have uh, provided this map to the public, which is, oh, way in the back, which kind of shows you which neighborhoods have the highest percentage. Oh, there you go. Um, so you can see the darker neighborhoods are the neighborhoods with the highest percentage of the total soft sites or units that will be generated through those soft sites. Um, your neighborhood, uh, the inner Richmond is listed as 6%, and the outer Richmond is listed as less than 1%. Um, and then, uh, let's see. So, uh, so a lot of the other neighborhoods you can see that are white here, those are mostly RH1 and RH2 districts. So those are neighborhoods where there are no soft sites because the program does not apply. And then South of Market, Petrero, and Mission are not part of this program. <coughs> already have the form-based code in those areas. So those have different ways to incentivize development. But it gives you a sense about where they are. Oh, it's on our website. Okay, is, is there a limit to how many projects allowed, are allowed simultaneous in one area? 
too much at one time is disruptive, causes traffic, noise, and business dis disruption. Uh, okay. <laughs> Um, I have never heard of anything like that, and it's a little bit out of my wheelhouse. I think the building department has um, construction management requirements. I don't know the ins and outs of them, but they do do very advanced planning with um, contractors and construction folks to make sure that's thought out. That's a good research question for us, and we'll get back to you all on that. Yes, Catherine. Uh, Catherine here in the front row has a uh, has a copy of the list of soft sites. So if you'd like to get it, see her afterwards for her email address. Um, where's all the water coming from for all the new uh, showers and toilets? <laughs> well, my shower broke last night, so we're safe with them now. No, um, I I think that's a great question. Again, another one that's outside my wheelhouse, but this program and all of our city planning are required to go through something called environmental review, which is um, consistent with the CEQA law of the, also the late 70s. It basically says, well, I think it started saying there are seven key issues, and so if the city and the public are, came out of the, the environmental acts of the late 70s and it said, if the city or the state are to take an action, we want to make sure it's not going to have a negative and unforeseen consequence on these seven issues. Um, it's a precedent-based law, so those seven issues now create documents that are yay high. Um, so we have looked closely at the water issues related to population. Um, interesting note that again, going regional, urbanites um, require the least amount of water per person per household. Um, a lot of that has to do with the high density of blooming. So the answer is dive into the CEQA document, and I can connect you to that. Truth be told, I don't like cards, but it is more efficient and gets us through the program. But let's move into a period now for the last 10 minutes where if there are any questions from the floor that you haven't written down, let's do them now. Um, yeah, Tom Pendergast, you. Talking about displacing uh, rent control tenants, um, and I know back on November 5th at the Planning Commission, they were talking about removing rent control RH3 housing entirely. I mean, there was discussion about this, about multi-unit houses being removed of, that are under rent control. Um, and at the December 3rd meeting, it seemed like John Rahim, the uh, director, was talking about the, the planning department was considering removing uh, RH3 housing entirely from uh, this program. I was wondering if you could clarify that, because from your comments tonight, it sounds like it's not really removing RH3 housing. It's more like if somebody's been under rent control, you give them a BMR housing rate when they move back in. In other words, if they get, because you know, obviously if somebody's been living 10 or 15 years in a place, right, and then they lose that place to you know, this location, when they come back in, it's not gonna be at that same rate, even though it's under rent control. So what you're saying is that it will come at a BMR rate? I think is that I got your question. Yeah, I think yeah. I got your question. So basically the question is, what happens, what is the city currently thinking about if there's a parcel that has a rent control building? What happens to the building? What happens to the That's people? RH3. Uh, the, we haven't really looked at it as zoning that's just zoning district. We're just looking at it program area Y. Okay. So program area Y, right now, the draft legislation that we introduced in September says you must at least replace those units mm -hmm. and you must notify those tenants. Right. What you heard at our November 5th and December 3rd hearing is wow. we're hearing a lot from decision makers, community members, tenant advocates, um, some from even staff, that that might not be enough. We might want to look at better tenant protections um, and then increasing the replacement requirement so it's replacement plus a certain percent of affordable. And I think every day I have a new idea and thought about what that might look like. Mm -hmm. And that's my big project, and our team is working really hard on this issue. Mm -hmm. And we expect to come back with the substitute legislation with an updated approach to that. So we're really interested in hearing from the community here what are the most important pieces. Well, so is a ban uh, just a Completely, if it's rent controlled and it's RH3, that cannot be uh, qualified under this program. That cannot be done under this program. Is that on the table or not? 
I've heard uh, from community members a suggestion. I've never heard it tied to a specific district, but some people have taken that position. Okay. Uh, and also uh, specify who you'd like to answer the question. And I'm not sure, Tom, the reason you said RH3, but multi unit. That's where you're typically going to have a lot of three unit rental buildings. So it's really common that that's where you find a lot of your rent controlled housing stock. Maybe that's the reason why you're zeroing yeah. in on that. Um, it, I, I will say that it's, it's encouraging to see the staff's thinking migrate toward where we are now compared to where it was at the beginning. Uh, but it's really important that uh, if, if they're not going to exempt sites that have existing housing entirely, so they just literally are not eligible, that the replacement is not counted against the bonus. And I think that's what we're hearing, right? It shouldn't be basically getting the double dip. It should be replacing what's there. And then on top of that, it's the 30% of new units. And then lastly, I think the really, really hard part of all this you know, this city has been scarred by the history of urban renewal, is how do you make sure folks who are in their homes actually get to come back? And it's really, really hard to do. And I, and I don't doubt that Jeff and Kirsten and the city would do it with, with the, the highest level of intention, but the kind of reality is that you often have an attrition, right? People often don't come back, and I think that's the real difficult policy question. And, uh, and who do you want to ask the question? Uh, well, I was going to... Uh, first of all, I wanted to congratulate the building department. This is much more understandable than what was presented a month ago. And uh, could you thank the Planning Association of, for the Richmond as well? <laughs> <laughs> Next, and if you could be quick uh, so we can get everybody in there. Uh, okay, Sharon. I think a small question about Airbnb. Uh, is there a limitation on how many people can stay in the building? Uh, and then the other question is I mean, so the BMR has restrictions against doing short term rentals in those buildings. Uh, and that's for the market rate units. Um, I, I know. I think they'd be subject to what the city's city's laws and ordinances are for this. Okay. Next question. Um, back there. I'm sorry to point. My dad said never pointing anybody. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was actually pointing at the woman in front of you. Right? <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. Given the fact that for three generations, 
and my family have watched homes be raised and the important issues be ignored by City Hall. This is not a speech. A uh, point I'd like to ask about, we, you heard lots of moaning and groaning when, you, when we talked about parking. And if we are going to move to try to keep families, okay, I will tell you the honest to God truth. A woman with twins under one year old or with kids going to two different schools and she has a job in the laundry of the hospital or you have an elderly parent, there is need to consider the reality that cars are part of the 21st century. We also have a lot of people who come in from Marin, from Daly City, from the East Bay. We can't eliminate them entirely. Rapid transit, subways, buses, wonderful. But please understand that by limiting it to one four, you will be considerably impacting <coughs> the ability of families to stay in San Francisco. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, the gentleman back there, and then you'll be next. Second row. Well, I just want to say, I know you're saying the percentage of the is built is smaller than in other areas, but if you consider like housing, I mean, you're talking about buildings that I think are probably higher than this ceiling, of which there are basically hardly any in the Richmond, and there's a lot of them so much. So the impact it will have in the Richmond, I think ultimately will be much, much greater than it will in Soma, where I see buildings like this all the time. I mean, I can't imagine this in the middle of a block, in the middle of the rich district. I mean, it's just overwhelmingly terrible. So I thought you did a great job, but I don't agree. <laughs>
but it's like 15,000 unit buildings are above their existing density limit. And I think it shows you the same thing we were talking about with the parking controls. It's just like the city is kind of like swinging the pendulum the other way. So we used to allow really big buildings, like all those beautiful 1920 apartment buildings, and now we're swinging the pendulum the other way. I know you don't want to get everyone in. Yeah. This is a great opportunity to get the conversation started. But I don't know if they couldn't attend that. Is it the opportunity to have another forum before the January 28th? All right. That's right. Um, so uh, Jeff and I will be uh, making the rounds through most of the districts in the city. Uh, we are working hard to come to at once to at least every district. I know also uh, there's another neighborhood organization, the Housing Rights Committee Coalition. I was like, committee or coalition in your district that would like to host a follow up meeting. Uh, we had known a date for that in like in January. My biggest recommendation for interested parties is on our website, you can sign up for the mailing list. We'll be posting notices about all of our community meetings. You can also find uh, more, like so much information. There's a one hour webinar led by yours truly. There's a two minute video. You can look at um, many of the workshops and commission hearings. There might be too much information. But then also email us comments. Hey, I, and at the PAR website, just Google SF PAR, all those links are up there to, uh, to you and your videos and movies. Uh, I don't want anybody to leave tonight with a question hanging, so I think we'll stay as long as there's a question. Anybody else that you know, wants to go, I guess it's okay, we'd like you to stay, but go ahead. And quick. <laughs> The character of that neighborhood is a beach character that has a lot of low light buildings. It's meant for rec relaxation. And what I want to know is what emphasis will, the, will, will this give to the character of the neighborhood such that when you have established that people really want low line buildings, will you take that into consideration? Because this seems to be emphasized those very kinds of considerations. So all of the projects would go through design guidelines and, and design review, and one of the values that San Francisco's design guidelines hold is being context sensitive. So I'm not familiar with the block that you're talking about. It's on the downtown street from Sunset Boulevard to, uh, to the beach, and along the beach. Okay, we'll take a look at that. But yeah, you, they would all go through design review. Next question, uh, right there. I was just going to ask if you want to join the bar tonight. Can we give you a check? Wow. You can. I, I'll wait here for the applications right over there. Anybody else who wants to do that would take check, cash, uh, your driver's license to hold on to until we get the money. <laughs> yeah, I just wanted to ask Jeff a question. You couldn't answer this, Kirsten, but it's the second time I've asked this question in two different meetings, at the Sunset meeting and here. Three and both times they haven't been answered. Can you, you work in the mayor's office, right? Okay. So you have access somehow, one way or another, to the records of the, the mayor's housing work group. I can't find them on the web. A couple of years ago there was a housing work group, we, all we kinds of people. records. You already asked. Answer, Excuse they me. They didn't answer. I know. So maybe I'll just paraphrase for you. Can they get the records? I read that online. Can you online? Can you put them online? So yeah, I mean, a lot of those records that you're talking about date back to last year or before. So yeah. Can you ask them about minutes? We didn't keep minutes in this. You didn't keep minutes. They're not valid. So maybe you guys can talk offline. Didn't Next question. Uh, back to working group. Didn't keep minutes. We have. Quite quite down. Yes, Residential design guidelines, which even in a type sometimes limit the mic? new buildings to below, depending on what's nearby. Uh, so that in, say, an RH3 area, which may be bordering on an RH2, uh, do these design guidelines mean anything as far as a new project, or by right they could go up? one or two stories as long as they have the affordable housing uh, no matter what the design guidelines say. Yeah, I think your question is that how will we interpret our 
sort of piles of design guidelines when these projects come forward. And so what we've done is create a, I think it's a 12 page document that's called the Affordable Housing Loans Program Design Guidelines. And we pulled design guidelines from all of the documents to explain how, how we would review it. And we created four new design guidelines that really speak to the tops of buildings to help um, projects that are above the height of the neighboring building really not impact the neighborhood character. So I, I'll connect you with those. Wait, wait, you had a question? I want to um, point this out. There are more than 30,000 units empty right now in the city. Okay, because of the bad rent control law, it's so strict that the owners don't want to rent them out. Can I ask so you to we can ask, can ask a question? That, then it would be you know, that many uh, housing uh, units available, that would be that much less you need to uh, build. Okay, so the software needs to go with the hardware. The hardware is the, the physical structure. The software is the policy. The policies and the, and the structures are not hand in hand right now. And they need to be more balanced. So people are willing to provide housing. And now people are not willing to provide housing. As many as you build, they are not willing to provide people waiting to ask questions. So if you have a question, possibly. This changed a lot from the Sunset District uh, meeting, uh, and I also want to thank Matthew Rich uh, for moderating and planning such a great meeting. Yeah. Um, the stuff, especially about rent control and BMR, wasn't in that last meeting, so I also want to commend you for that. My question is about the thing called AB 252, um, which was directly related to the stuff about rent control. Uh, is that not a law yet? I assume it's not, because AB means assembly bill, right? Oh, it's been signed. Yeah. Okay, cool. So my questions were done, and I was wondering if we were like waiting to pass that before passing this. So the, the gentleman in the last room. Uh, we're a small site that you say you have. Do you have a physical address on those places? Uh, Kathy does up here. Oh, you do? Yes. Okay, I have a two-part question. So my first question, all the images you gave us had these <coughs> BMR buildings on the corners. Can one be built in the middle of a, a block that is um, not zoned RH1 or RH2, but currently maybe only has houses that are two or you know, maybe one or two floors over a garage? And then there's a second part of my question. Okay. Can you clarify, do you mean if this is the block and then in the middle? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So let's say that building goes in. And I think we've all been to a lot of planning com commission meetings where, you know, neighbors are arguing about, you know, how far back can the building go and, and how much higher can the building and the store be go. And there are all kinds of contentious battles over this. So once that BMR building goes in, and then let's say I'm next door to it, and somebody's on the other side, can I now go up? I mean, they take the average of the two heights. I mean, you work in the planning department. So is it just going to encourage? So this program, just to be totally clear, is not available for people to just add a few stories to their building. I understand. Okay. But once that building goes up, it influences what can happen on the rest of the so we do averaging for rear yards, and for heights, I think we use design guidelines, and I don't know that there's a, a hard math rule for that, but I can look into that for you, and sort of what the outcomes might be. Any more questions? Yeah, I, I would actually like to clarify that a little bit. If let's say we have a block where most of the houses are single family or con two, two unit condos, and then there's a few houses that are three units or more RH3, does that, the fact that those RH3 units are on that block mean that that block is therefore, can, can be, uh, any unit on this could be uh, in this program or only that building or none of them? Because when you're talking about replacing an RH3, you're talking about commercial on the, on the bottom 
and then you know retail up on top. I mean, excuse me, residential up on top. So I'm just wondering, how does that break down exactly? So the zoning goes parcel by parcel, and right. it's not contagious in the block. So if you're zoned RH1, no matter what else is on your block, you're still RH1. So the RH3 could be potentially developed under this, even though maybe it's the only one on the block. I've never seen a block like that, but if that exists in our city, then yes. Okay, any more questions? Yeah. La last question, unless someone has one quickie. Uh, teachers, firemen, people who work for the city, what kind of priorities are they going to be? I think it's real important that teachers be part of the city. As a teacher, I find, you know, I walk down the street, I see every once in a while I run into one of my former students. Unfortunately, most of them had to move away, you know, and I feel real. But I feel that there should be some kind of responsibility of keeping uh, people who serve the city close to the people they serve. Oh. That's a great question. Actually, we've been meeting with Supervisor Marr and his aides on this particular issue. It's something that I think he's really interested in looking at. And the Union School, the district's Wow, I'm tired. The school district the teachers union are working with us to help make sure that this program or other programs are really meeting those needs. So that's something that I can, I'm committing. I'll report back to you on. And we are working to sort of make sure some of these units get the right income levels. Well, thank you all for your presentation.